Welcome friends to this third and final day of our three day event in New Jersey. I'm very happy to see all of you here. It looks like such a nice, wonderful family meeting. It doesn't look like there are any strangers here. They all look like we all belong to each other. That's a wonderful feeling. <coughs> I mentioned to you yesterday that we have complicated our spiritual path by putting too much intellect into it. The spiritual path is very simple. It's just a matter of using our attention. Just instead of putting attention outward on this physical universe, we have to put our attention on ourselves. No matter what we think is ourselves. But the self should be beyond any temporary covering that we have on ourselves. Right now we know that the physical body is very temporary. Nobody has lived in this physical body forever. Masters have come, great masters have come. As I was saying, that nobody has lived in this physical body forever. Masters have come, great saints have come. My own great master came. They all left their physical body. Nobody has survived in only clothing that they are wearing, which is like a physical body that they are wearing, is temporary wearing. Therefore, if we want to put attention on ourselves, it should not be on the covering upon ourselves. It should be upon ourselves. When we look at ourselves, even if we are in the body, and we say, what are we if we are not in the body? Where are we if we are not in the body? Where are we thinking from? Where are we asking this question from? When we ask these questions from ourselves, we find out that we are talking from inside. We are looking outside through the eyes. And we are connecting with the world, mostly with our vision, by looking outside through the eyes. And it appears that the thinking process, everything is happening in our brain, inside our head, not any other part of our body. Therefore, it is not difficult to know that you are really operating in the wakeful state from the point behind the eyes, which we call the third eye center. Some people think we are operating from the heart. That is not true at all. You can feel the heart is below you. You can just check where are you as conscious beings. Not in the heart. Heart is an important center of energy because the blood flows from there, circulates throughout the body and sustains us. But that does not mean our attention is flowing from the heart. It is only in a way of saying head and heart. Head and heart did not really mean the literal head or the literal heart. It meant that which feels and that which thinks. These were two different things. So what felt was called heart and what thought or thinking was called head. These are just terms used for that. So people sometimes mistake that the heart center of energy is our center of existence, which is not true at all. But it does become center of existence when we are not awake. This idea that we are always behind the eyes is not correct. In the physical body, our focal point, our center of consciousness shifts from place to place. Only when we are awake, we see with these eyes, then we are behind the eyes. When we are not awake, we are not behind the eyes. We shift our position. The actual position is, if you are not awake, you can keep your eyes open, you won't see. Whether you are under anesthesia, we shift your conscious center, or you are in sleeping state, it shifts. When we sleep at night, 
the very fact that we think we are here begins to shift downwards. It actually goes downwards. And when we have dreams, our center, which is right now behind the eyes, moves down to the throat. It goes that further down. You can check this out tonight if you like. When you are feeling very sleepy and want to go to sleep, you try to touch your eyes. In the wakeful state, with your eyes closed, you can raise your hands and know where the eyes are. Any number of times you can touch your eyes. When you are sleepy, try to touch your eyes, you touch your nose. And you think you are touching your eyes. Which means that your center from where consciousness is operating itself is moving downwards. In dream state, we don't remember our wakeful state, therefore we cannot touch. There are some yogic practices in which you can retain the consciousness that you are still in the body but dreaming. During that state, when you want to touch your eyes, you actually touch your throat. This center is a center for dreaming. So this life force, our consciousness, is operating in the body but it appears that the center from where it radiates our attention keeps on shifting. It's only in the wakeful state that we are really operating from the third eye center behind the eyes. That is why if you want to do meditation to discover yourself, it is best to do it in the wakeful state when you are fully awake. If you are sleepy, do not meditate till you wake up. Take a shower, over shower. When you're fully awake, then you meditate. So this is something that was learned by some of the old masters whom I had the chance to meet. And they said, we did not realize, we thought even when we go to sleep halfway, our meditation can continue. Similarly can continue by habit. The mind can be habituated to keep on repeating words. And that can continue even in sleep. But the attention, the placing of attention inside you can only be done when you are fully awake. It's an important factor. So that is why some people are half asleep and they say we are going to meditate. Many of them say, can we meditate while we are lying down? Well, of course you can if you can remain awake while you are lying down. But the tendency to sleep is much more when you lie down than when you are sitting upright. So that is why this body has been constructed in a strange way that the torso of the body from the bottom to the top of the head functions in a particular way when you are sitting upright. You sit in upright, the structure of the body is such, the spinal cord is in such a shape. The reason is that the energy centers that are also placed in the body, starting from the bottom, the rectum, the genitals, the navel, the heart, the throat and the eyes, they operate in a vertical sense and the spinal cord has been designed to be parallel to those centers. The spinal cord of our body is at the back and these centers are in front of it. And it is almost like having a building set up. We don't set up buildings flat, we always set them up upright because we say we are going up we're going down. We don't say we're going east and west in our buildings. So that is why the structure of the body is like a temple. It's built like that. And therefore, there are steps that you can take to go from one center to another. Those steps are slow meditational steps. And there are different kinds of mantras prescribed by these yogis to move from one center to the other. I had a chance to practice with some yogis and how the upright position was very necessary for moving from center to center. On the other hand, these are like staircases. We move up through words that we repeat. But the spinal cord behind is like an elevator. And we use it like an elevator. When they start meditation, and they start with the eyes, they close their eyes and pull backwards to the spine and go all the way down by elevator. Then they come one by one on the staircase. That is a normal practice of this yogic exercises which are quite effective to awaken the energy centers and have some unusual strange experiences.
So I tried those things and that is also necessary to have the body upright for those exercises. And this particular yoga that great master Baba Sabal Singh taught, the Sulchab Yoga, also is facilitated by having the body upright. So my suggestion is that you do not try to meditate in a lying down position or when you're feeling half sleepy. So I'm just trying to make it easy to understand this is all a matter of common sense. Still on. <laughs> the cameraman is giving a suggestion. <laughs> I don't know his hand. <laughs> just a, a comic relief in the middle. <laughs> when we have a serious subject we discuss, we have a comic relief. Sometimes they tell jokes. Especially famous has become Jonathan's joke. <laughs> Shall I tell you now? <laughs> that will be a big comic relief on the middle of my discussion about meditation. His joke is about parrots. <laughs> I have heard many jokes about parrots. The first one I heard was a very sensible one and it made sense to me and appealed to me. And that was that there was a merchant who used to do import and export. He used to export textiles and things from India into Africa and used to bring cashew nuts and other things from Africa back to India. In one of his visits to Africa, he went to a jungle where there were a lot of parrots flying. He liked those parrots, they were so beautiful birds, so he decided to take one back home. So he caught one of the parrots, bought a cage, and put the parrot in the cage and brought back home. In India, parrots like certain kind of food, we call them Mirch and churi. Mirch is chilies. They like bitter chili. They like very sharp chilies. And they also like churi, which is just a mixture of wheat and some fats and so on. Put some sweet in it. And they love that. These are two favorite foods of the parrots. If you have a parrot as a pet, you would know that. I haven't had a parrot except that once I was talking in. Cambridge in, in Boston when I was studying in the university there and I happened to say I am not really the speaker, I am like a parrot. <laughs> that I merely repeat what the great master had said. So I am like a parrot. One man was so impressed with that statement that he sent me a parrot for my birthday. <laughs> in a case. I told him I don't know how to take care of the parrot. <laughs> He says, okay, I will show you parrots which have better taken care of. He took me to Florida, and in Florida there, is a, there was a parrot jungle, a small little artificially made place where they were training parrots to do various tricks. One parrot was trying to ride a bicycle, one parrot was trying to do other tricks, topsy-turvy tricks and so on. And I was walking ahead of that group of people and my wife was with me, some friends of hers, and they were left behind, I was really fast in walking. And I saw a parrot, which spoke like a human voice. Most parrots have a quack, quacky voice, you know. But this one was saying, what's the hurry? I stopped. <laughs> what's the hurry? And I began to laugh, and the parrot began to laugh. <laughs> with his head thrown up. And those people caught up with me and saw the parrot laughing and me laughing, they got sure I was a parrot. <laughs> but to come back to the story of the Indian merchant who bought a parrot and he trained the parrot. And the parrot used to enjoy the churi and the chilies. And after a year, when the, parrot, when the merchant was going back to Africa on his next visit, he asked his parrot, do you have any message to
to send to your friends back home? He said, certainly, tell them I am enjoying my life in this cage. I eat churi and chili and I sing and dance, I am very happy. So the merchant left. After he finished his business in Africa, he went back to that same jungle forest and collected the parrots. He said, I have a message for you. You remember last year I took one parrot with me to India. He enjoys his life in the cage and he sent a message for you. His message is, I am enjoying my churi and my chilies and I dance and sing in my cage. I am very happy. On hearing this, one elderly parrot sitting on a branch near him got tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. The merchant was very surprised. He said, this parrot must have been very close to the parrot I took home that he could not bear to hear his message and has given up his life. Anyway, feeling sorry, he went back and told the parrot in the cage in his own home. He said, I conveyed your message that you are enjoying your life in the cage, singing, dancing, eating churi and chili. On hearing this, he said, one of your elderly parrots there, when he heard this message, he had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. Upon hearing this, the parrot in the cage had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. Very sad that I should not have perhaps conveyed this message to this parrot. He took the body of the <coughs> parrot, threw it out. As soon as he threw the body of the parrot out, the parrot opened his wings and flew up. He said, so you are dead after all? He says, no, nor the other parrot dead whom you saw. He just sent me a message. The message was, if you want to be free, die while living. <laughs> a nice story. Not like the one I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> the other story is about a church pastor. A church pastor who had two parrots and he trained them to sing nice hymns and he gave them beads in their hands so they would play move with the beads and say nice verses. So it was a very nice atmosphere. One of his parishioners came to him, he said, what a nice thing you have done, that the parrots are always singing nice words, holy words, and creates a very nice ambiance and very nice atmosphere around. And the pastor said, you can also have parrots, they can be trained to say anything. So you can go and buy two parrots, and you also give them beads, and they train them and they will also start speaking whatever word you train them. So this man went to the pet shop and he bought two parrots and brought them home. And when he opened the cage, he found out they were two female parrots. And as soon as he opened the cage, they said, we are hookers, you want to have a good time? <laughs> he was shocked what kind of parrots he had brought. He went and told the pastor, I made a mistake. These my parrots are saying things like this. The pastor said, parrots only speak what they are trained. Maybe the previous owner taught the parrot to say these words. You can retrain them. In fact, he said, I can lend you my own parrots and when your parrots will see my parrots playing on, on the beads in their hands and saying holy words, they will also learn how to play with beads and say holy words. So he brought the pastor's parrots home and he opened them. Then he opened his own parrots there and of course his parrots, the female, two female parrots, they said, we are hookers, you want to have a good time? <laughs> On that, the male parrots of the pastor, one looked at the other and he said, throw away your beads, our prayers have been answered. Oh <laughs> <laughs> God, Lights have to be given to God. <laughs> to come back to the most important thing I was talking about, <laughs> that to make meditation effective, <coughs> people are meditating without it being effective. I feel very sad when I see that. People are meditating almost like a ritual, almost like a religious ceremony. But then what have we gained? <coughs> If we merely have shifted our daily ritual 
from going to church on Sundays, going to temple on Tuesdays, going to the mosque on Fridays, and then come back and start doing similar things and call it meditation. That is not the purpose of getting initiated or get doing meditation. The purpose of meditation is to personally explore, to personally investigate who are we, what is our reality, and where is our reality. If we are in the body sitting somewhere because our consciousness is operating in the body, is everything within the consciousness that is operating in the body. This requires a serious interest in investigating who we are. If we are still involved in the same way in our worldly activities and we think instead of doing some worship, instead of doing prayer, we should do meditation, we are not making use of this great opportunity. So therefore, if we have got such a great opportunity to investigate during our lifetime, while we are here, then we should meditate effectively. The effective meditation means that you put all your attention, all your attention in the wakeful state, in an alert state, not in a sleepy state, alert state. If you are not alert, be alert, have a walk, have a shower. There was a, a successor of the Red Master in the Dera. He was a professor of agriculture. Sadar Bahadur Jagat Singh. And I went and stayed with him once. Out of curiosity, my father sent me, go and learn something from that great saint. He's like a saint. And I found he was very particular to have a quick shower, be absolutely alert, exercise if necessary. When he's completely alert, then he would meditate. It's important to meditate in alert, wakeful state. So that is the time when your attention is completely functioning behind the eyes and not sinking downwards. Second thing, when you place your attention behind the eyes at the third eye center, the tendency still will be to do what you do at night, let me go to sleep. And what happens when you go to sleep, your attention tends to sink. You will notice that you have to create a floor, artificial, imaginative floor behind the eyes. Make it strong. Put steel girders in it so that you can jump on it inside and you cannot go down. If it is very soft, you go to sleep. Telling you a very practical tip. Make that level behind the eyes on which you are placing yourself and place yourself with the kind of symbols that you're familiar with, like place a chair. We are sitting on chairs right now. We can place a chair there. Place a cushion. Some of them are sitting on the floor. Sit on the floor, cross legged. Make it as realistic as possible, the way we do outside, to which we are used to. Sit there comfortably. No stress. No tension on the eyes or on the head. We, once we say we are behind the eyes, we have to concentrate on being there. Look what is around. The darkness, are the eyes in front of you? Yes. The eyes go in front of you, ears are on either side, you are in the center of a nice beautiful place. Since the beautiful place is created imaginatively, you can make it as beautiful as you like. Place nice rugs, curtains there. Put curtain drapes there. Make it a beautiful meditation chamber. That, that is the right meditation chamber. And make it as beautiful. Place flowers there. Put furniture there. But it should all be inside, not outside. Make it an attractive place that you want to go there all the time. It's so beautiful. Make it such a, such a place like you would make an outside place. I go to my friends' homes and they say, we bought a new chair, very comfortable chair for meditation. Mm -hmm. And I go and I said, let me see the chair. And I said, can I sit on your chair of meditation and get that nice feeling? So I sit on the chair. I said, very nice chair, but it won't feel like meditating because I'm thinking of the chair. 
And if it's an expensive chair, I'm thinking more about it. I invested more money in it. When you meditate on that chair, where is your attention? It's caught so much in the chair for so long that it makes more difficult to withdraw your attention inside. Because you, you have brought a special chair for doing something, and that is why the attention is being drawn by the chair. I go to my friend's houses, we have a special room for meditation, and we have bought some cushions to sit on. I bought a special prayer mat, and I'm doing meditation. I said, let me see that. They see so beautiful. I said, if I were to meditate on this, I'd be thinking of that rug and carpet and cushions only. Why are we making them outside? When we want to go inside, where is the advantage of making something outside? Why do we say, this is my special place outside, the attention goes outside? We want to put the attention inside. Why not decorate the place inside? It won't cost you any money. It's made by imagination and attention. You make a beautiful place. And when you will sit, start sitting there, you will notice there are no walls. You can make the walls with your imagination. Make the room as big as you like. You can even make it a large garden outdoor and sit in the middle in a tree. This is all the work of imagination, which we are using merely to pull our attention inwards. I'm giving you very practical tips that make that your wonderful, beautiful, attractive place to meditate. Then you will like to meditate because you'll remember how well you decorated it. So do not bring anything that is required to be drawing your attention inside, outside of yourself. When you bring outside things, your attention goes outside. Make meditation more difficult. But people, if you make meditation merely a ritual, I am doing meditation because my master told me to do it. I try to do two and a half hours, it's very difficult, I do half an hour. It's a ritual then you're not serious about finding out who you are. Then following the same thing which we follow in religion. Just a tradition, just a ceremony, ceremonial thing that we are doing. But the opportunity we have with initiation by a perfect living master is to find the truth while you are still here. That is why make everything that is within you, using your imagination, using your thoughts, Think about what is happening inside. Put all your thoughts on this. You can imagine your master inside. Because when he initiates, he is inside. If you imagine other people, they are not inside. They are outside. Attention goes outside. If you imagine your master who has initiated you, he is inside. And you can very quickly have a conversation with the master inside. Start with your own imaginary conversation and then watch out how the imagined master becomes the real one. It will happen with practice. Therefore, the whole idea of doing meditation at the third eye center is to place your attention in whatever means you can inside. You want to dance, dance inside. You want to sing, sing inside. Do you know you can sing as loud as you like and you'll be absolutely quiet in your body? It's all happening inside. That is why create a lifestyle in which you live inside. See how easy meditation will become. That you love to go inside, relax there. Secondly, a lot of people, when they meditate, they put a lot of strain on their eyes. They think that we have to see with these eyes and turn them around. And they sometimes I see, if I can say, let me open your eyes, they try to turn backward. Eyes won't turn backward, they're not made like that. It's against the physiology of the body that the eyes will turn backward. Nor will these eyes see anything with eyes closed. We are seeing with other eyes, with which we are seeing imaginary things. Which eyes are seeing what's, when you imagine something, those are the inner eyes. Those are the eyes of your sense perception. Those are the eyes of your astral body, which are seeing when you are not opening these eyes. So you have that possibility of seeing without these eyes. Use those eyes for everything that you want to see. 
Use those hands for doing anything. You want to cook a meal? Do it there. Bring everything there. Do transfer all your activities that you do, something that you love, transfer them all over there. And what, what is the idea of doing that? That the attention will be drawn there. The whole object of meditation for experience of the self is to withdraw your attention inside. So do anything you can to bring the attention inside. When you will put the attention inside, Apart from repetition of the mantra, the symbol given to you by the Master, which is a great protection against negative forces coming in our way. Very important use of those words is mechanical use. Yes, repeat them so you don't think too much of other things while the mind is repeating. But if negative entities come, negative thoughts come, they are quickly removed by repetition of child words, empowered words, which are given to us at the time of initiation. Very important factor. So use them. Continuously use them. You have a conversation with your master. Imagined to start with and real later on. And the reality of it will be that you will be able to repeat word at the same time, have conversation, and the master confirms it. That it's he himself there and not some image made by you. So th these are beautiful experiences that we get. And that is all your job. To go and have a conversation and manifest the master and be a friend of the master. He'll be the best friend you've ever seen. This consistency of friendship cannot be matched by anybody. He's a friend always. And he's on call and available always. Imagine what kind of life you will have in this physical world that you have a friend with you, with you 24 7, always. It's a very big advantage in life itself here. It's not only that we are finding something inside our life, outside changes, because we are so lonely, we have nobody to talk to here. We have so many thoughts in our heart, in our head that we don't want to share with anybody. We don't know how they will react to it. And here is a friend with whom you can share everything. Anything, at any time. Take full advantage of this possibility that arises out of meditation, if done properly. And then, the quality of meditation is far more important than the time spent on meditation. People try to catch up with the time. I gave an example of a man who meditated very well on his watch. Many of us do that. Some, sometimes we set an alarm. Suppose the guy set an alarm two and a half hours ahead and then I meditate. What, where is my attention? Waiting to hear when the alarm will ring. Naturally, I have created a distraction for myself right in the beginning of meditation, not in the middle, right in the beginning, I said, I will stop when the alarm rings. Entire period we have closed our eyes, we are thinking of the alarm when it will ring. Very difficult to concentrate your attention. Want to have an alarm? Set up an alarm on a clock inside. Do everything inside. There will be no ringing outside when the inner clock rings. You will get more inside, not outside. This is such a simple thing that we should not forget that our role is very little. In the spiritual journey to our true home, we have been given a very small task compared to what the Master is going to do. Our task is just to reach that point and concentrate our attention, third eye center, which makes us forget about our hands and feet and body, eventually the whole body, we forget and that becomes the reality of ourselves. That's all. After that, we are in the company of somebody who knows the entire route to our true home. We are going under a very good guide. We are going in the guidance of somebody who is operating at all times from our destination. 
It's a beautiful experience. So that is why I am suggesting to you these little tips. So make meditation effective. It's worthwhile. It will change your life even here. I call that peripheral effects, that you get some temporary benefits here also. But these are also worthwhile. Supposing there was no other benefit. Supposing there is no true home, no such car, no. It's all made up psychologically. Psychologists say you just make it all up. I used to have some uh, discussions with psychologists in the university. And they were very interested in what I was saying. They would come every day to talk. And I would say, well, this is something that you apply from your own point of view. You tell me what you think is happening. They said, the mind can create everything. You are associating some visions, some strange things happening which you think is spiritual. It's not spiritual, it's psychological. That it is the mind that can create anything. I said, okay, let me accept your proposition. That the psychological impact on me is, I have reached a state where I am happy 24-7. I've experienced. People sometimes say, how do you maintain the happiness? They think it is too strange. And I said, you are all on Prozac and antidepressants. Because you are psychologists. You commit more suicide than anybody else in the world. The highest rate of suicide is among psychologists and psychiatrists. It's amazing that these are the people who are telling. I said, let's believe whatever you say. Supposing I'm deluding myself. I'm deluding myself into entire happiness and clarity of vision in my life. Worthwhile deluding. You tell me better way to get the clarity and happiness. Everybody in the world is seeking happiness. What is wrong? But I said, you are only discussing it theoretically because you never experienced it. If you experience, you will see the reality of that experience in the experience. And there are experiences we have, all of us have, in which the reality is contained in the experience. I gave them an example. I said, when you wake up in the morning, are you sure you are awake? Yes, we are. Don't you ask for proof at that time? How am I feeling I am awake? What makes you certain, 100% certain that you are awake? All of us are having that experience of waking up in the morning and sure we are awake. Ten people may be standing and saying, you are not awake. You say, I am awake. I know it. How do you know it? The state of awakening carries its own evidence, its own experiential evidence that is the truth. Therefore, there are some experiences. So I told those psychologists, and of course some of them were affected by these things. Two of the professors at Harvard University at that time, they were experimenting with altered states of consciousness. I had the opportunity talk to them and their so-called disciples. They set up a yoga center with about 50 recruits, students. And because of that activity, both of them were expelled from the university. Later on, they both had to leave the country. One was Dr. Richard Atwood, who went, after being fired from the university, went to India and changed his name to Baba Ram Das and wrote beautiful books. The other one, was Timothy Leary, professor. He left and went into the Pacific Ocean Island, some small island, and set up a church of his own. And he called it the Church of the Boohoo, because his theory was that there is no difference between the sublime and the ridiculous. So that's how he named the church. But these people first experimented with mushrooms, with chemicals like LSD, DMT, they experimented to see altered states. It's only when they went to India or went over, they discovered it's not necessary. I was able to discuss their experiences without taking anything. And they were surprised, how can you know that? I said, what you're talking is very simple, awakening of some of the factors in 
our energy center. These are energetic experiences. There's nothing spiritual about it. To have an experience you are seeing different colors somewhere on the walls, does it make you spiritual? To have an experience you are flying somewhere, you can fly right now in your imagination, right now. Where's the big spirituality about it? Have you discovered your own self at all? Not at all. That is why these psychologists, these people, they would discuss these things. But there is nothing like personal experience. <laughs> there is nothing like personally verifying something. That is why this path, this teaching of this great master, Baba Sawan Singh, is not a theoretical model to discuss with, compare with other models. It's a simple way. If you practice, you can find out who you are. In truth, immortal as a soul. You can also find out not only that you are immortal as a soul and a unit of consciousness, you can find out that you have always been and always will be part of the totality of that consciousness, have never been separated. Only an experience has been separated, not you. It's a wonderful experience to know the real truth, ultimate truth. That is the ultimate truth that we can find out through this method. The method is simple. Just I am giving you more hints on the beginning. Uh, what we do in the beginning. You are not responsible for the rest of it. Rest of it will happen. But don't go alone. That is my recommendation. Don't go alone. There was one beautiful disciple of great master. One of the three women, young women who came to take care of master, they gave up their husband, gave up their life, they gave up just to be with the master. There was a lot of criticism of the master also. Some scandalous news were also published in the newspapers at that time about great master having affairs with his women and all that. But the women were constant in their seva, in their service, in their dedication, in their loyalty to the master and served him till the end. One was a short lady, <coughs> very beautiful. I liked her very much, she was our neighbor. And in the beginning when I was very small, she taught me how to fly. She said, we can fly. I said, okay, how, just fly? <laughs> it was very beautiful days, I remember. She was also in the neighboring house in the Dera in Bias. Her name was Bibi Rakhi. There was a taller lady, thin but tall, whose name was Bibi Rally. There was a third one, stout and strong, whose name was Bibi Lajo. Lajo, Rally, Rakhi. Three <coughs> women who took care of Great Master right to the end of his life. The stout one, the strongest one, Push the others out. A lot of drama used to take place. <laughs> Nothing new. It's what we see today also happened then. Don't think the atmosphere was completely different. It was a worldly situation there also. The stout one pushed the others out. The tall one was able to hold on to the kitchen which was outside the great master's house. And she began to cook for the great master. The third one was pushed out and had to do with cooking for the general public who came to the Deva, to different people. So the most advanced in experiences was the third one, who was pushed out. Every morning, great master would go at three o'clock and see her in the hut where she was living, next to our house. So we also got a chance to see. The Second one was making the food for him. She was happy to make food, but when she would bring to serve in the dining area, which was the house of great master, the stout one would say, your boundary and here, give me the food. <laughs> <laughs> Telling you this old story. A wonderful drama went on. And, but they, they all were very dedicated and they all meditated and they all had 
some good experiences. The short one had the highest. The short one was our neighbor. So she had different experiences which surprised us sometimes. One day she was crying loudly. Her door was locked. She lived in a very small place next to us and she was crying loudly. So we tried to open the door, something has happened, and we broke it open. And there she was sitting crying, but instead of upright, like meditating and crying. So we ran to great master and said that Bibi is crying. Bibi only met a lady, and we said that Bibi is crying. And he said, let me go and see. So he came, and he saw her crying. He says, why are you crying? She wouldn't answer any question from us, but she answered his question. And he said, why are you crying? I have gone into hell. How did you go into hell? Out of curiosity. <laughs> just wanted to see. He saw the astral plane. He just was drifting away on his own. He said, is anybody hurting you? No. Then why are you crying? I can't see how much they are hurting others, burning people. I can't. Imagine what uh, there was torture going on here. I didn't have no idea. And he said, so why don't you repeat the five words I told you? He said, I've forgotten those words. In this torture I'm seeing, I will forgotten. Can you hear my voice? Great Master said, yes, I can hear your voice. Follow my voice. And then she opened her eyes, put her head on his feet. And then he addressed all of us who were around him. He said, sometimes out of curiosity, when you have that experience of an astral plane, you can go to negative territories. They are also all there. Therefore, please be cautious. Don't forget to repeat the words which are empowered and keep you away from this kind of experience. And also, try not to go anywhere above that point above the point where you reach third eye center without the great without your master accompanying you. It was a good lesson. So I am saying the same thing to you that people try to have curiosity to see this new vision that come up, the new world that opens up and they hear of heavens and hells and they go, like to visit them. Visit them but with your master. First thing is to manifest the form of the master inside. Be friendly, stabilize that. It takes time. But stabilize that form. And then go anywhere you like and enjoy whatever you want to see. There's so much to see. There's far more to see inside than you can see outside here. So people like to fulfill their uh, curiosities and they want to see things. Yes, do it. It's part of our is part of our mental desires. The mind, when it begins to see those things, finds the attraction to this world very little. That they are not so attractive as we thought. They are not pulling the temptations, they are not pulling outside. Temptations start pulling inside. And meditation becomes very easy at that point. Meditation is difficult today because the mind is dragging us outside. When the mind begins to enjoy anything inside, it begins to be very friendly with us and wants us to meditate. The thoughts come, why not meditate, we have a little time. A 15 minute break, have a visit inside. That's how the mind starts functioning. So it's a very beautiful way that the mind can be turned from enemy to friend. <coughs> he's our greatest enemy. When he becomes a friend, he's our greatest friend. It's just an instrument. It's not a living thing. We are making it alive. This consciousness is life. Nothing can function as a living thing unless we put this life into it. And our consciousness puts life into it. The source of consciousness is our totality of consciousness in which we are one unit. And this one unit is generating the experiences by creating a mind, creating sense perceptions, creating these bodies, creating the worlds around us. And it's all part of consciousness. Consciousness has unlimited capacity to be conscious of anything it wants. We call it creation. It has the capacity 
to create something and then make it real. Very good means it has to make things real. The sense perceptions were created so that we can use one sense perception to make the reality of the other. I want to see, is this table real? I am seeing the table, I touch it and say it's real. I have used two sense perceptions, seeing and touching, and using them to make it real. I can do the same thing in a dream. In the dream I can see the table and say, is it real? I touch it in the dream, I'll say it's real. That's how dreams become real. The, the, the dispersal of perception into sense perceptions to different perceptions helps to create reality for us. And not only that, we create reality by transferring consciousness into experiences of many, of others. And the others then, because of the way our sense perceptions operate, two eyes create distance, two ears create distance, they both create distance, and looks like it's a wide big world. It's creating reality. It's such a beautifully designed way. We are not creating pictures, we are not creating imaginary things, creating realities. And it's a wonderful way that we create realities in order for consciousness, which is the only reality, to experience what has been made into reality. People say these are different levels of illusions. No, these are different levels of realities. We don't experience illusion, we experience reality. So that is why it's a wonderful way in which consciousness has transformed experience into something beyond experience as if the objects and people and things outside are all real. What a wonderful way to do. And we discover this truth by going to the source. Just like we would go to a movie and see the movie, we forget it's just a flat screen with shadows falling on it. We don't think we the characters are acting on it. We begin to believe they are really acting on it. We feel sorry for some people going to be hurt on the stage. We feel very happy when we see somebody happy. It's just a shadow. There's nobody there. We believe there is somebody there. And we wait to see what will happen next. What will happen next is already known. We don't know at that time. Why? Don't we know that the film that is being played has already been pre-recorded? And what will happen next is automatically going to happen next. Then why are we surprised in a movie? Oh, now what will happen? Oh, I didn't expect that. Why are we saying those things when this complete illusion? We have just by our own suppression of our doubt about the thing made it into reality. <coughs> this is amazing how we can create reality out of a projected image. These are projected images and we make them into reality and build into the system something that makes it real. This distance and all, they are creating in 3D movies. I, I think I mentioned about that 3D movie in Universal Studios or, some, or in Disney World, Florida. I went to and there the movie was about a truck carrying mice or rats or mice and on the way the rear door of the truck opened up and all the mice escaped and they all ran into the audience. Everybody screamed. They were all on the screen only. Nothing was moving from there. And everybody lifted up their feet. <laughs> because they could feel the mice in their feet. Of course, that was a clever trick. They had some air pumps in the feet. And they pushed the air pumps. And there was so much stink of the mice. Yeah, that also was built into the chairs. Yeah. Such a simple thing. Now they are showing demonstrations of virtual reality. Virtual reality, you really feel you can meet people, you do, can do anything in virtual reality. After seeing some of those virtual reality experiences generated by mechanics and machines, some people are thinking, they look so real. It's quite possible. This is also virtual reality somebody is creating. Maybe somebody is creating this whole world 
or a computer somewhere. This is scientific thought today. Scientific thought being examined whether somebody is using a computer outside and creating all of us. And he's putting the sense of consciousness into us through the computer somewhere outside of this show, outside of space even. So a, this is how the world has been created, actually. They are thinking of it now, but if they go inside and find out, that's how realities were created. It does not make the show less interesting. If we were to have all the knowledge, all the realization, everything we know the truth, we will still enjoy the show. But we will enjoy more than we are doing now. Because now, by taking it seriously as the only reality, we don't like the negative part of the show. We don't like the suffering part of it. We don't like the painful part of it. We like the good part of it. But if, when we see a movie, we like the whole of it. We don't say, I only like that part, not the other part. The whole story is consistent if we see the whole of it. This life is consistent if we see both ups and downs in this. So that is why with that awareness and knowledge, you begin to appreciate the whole of life. And this whole roller coaster movement of ups and downs, you begin to appreciate. It's a created reality. And this duality, the best way to appreciate the dual nature of this creation, right up to the three worlds of, of the senses, the body, and the mind. These three regions are all pairs of opposites. That's a world of duality. When do we appreciate why duality was created is when we go into a non-dual state, our true home, beyond the mind. When we go there, we realize we appreciate our original state far more by seeing a state which is not our own. It's been opposite created. In a reality, a true reality, where there was no opposite, we created by this method an opposite of duality and to greater appreciation of our own true self. Now, this is an important point because it involves the word appreciation. Can you imagine appreciation is a very important thing? We go to masters and ask for things. Master, please help me this thing. Master, I want this. Have we ever asked, Master, what do you want? No. <laughs> Supposing we were to ask, Master, what do you want from us? His word will, his answer will be one word. Appreciation. <coughs> Gratitude. Just appreciate what I'm giving you. If you do that, I'm happy. You to God, say, God, you've given us everything. Do you want something from us? You say, appreciate. Just appreciate what I've given you. It's such a beautiful thing. And how do we really make a spiritual appreciation? A spiritual appreciation of our own spiritual goal, of our own going back to true home, the greatest appreciation comes that we are not the duality in our reality, that we are beyond the duality. And non-dual state, we appreciate by having an experience of a dual state. Actually, this is so big a point that this justifies the whole of creation. Some people say, why has God made this place with pain and pleasure both? Why not all good times? So you have good times where you belong. It's all good times. But you don't know what good times are. Did you see this? Then you know what good times are. So there's great appreciation for your own original state. So great justification for creating this. And then after all, it's immediately, I got this morning, <coughs> some friend of mine writing, I had a horrible dream last night. And I was so scared in that dream. When I woke up, I said, thank God it was a dream. Thank God it was not real. I wrote to him that exactly what you will say when you go here to home. Thank God it was all a dream. Thank God it was not real. The reality is only your own self and your true home. Worthwhile going to your true home to increase the appreciation of your own original state and also understand why the non-original state was created. It was created for our purpose. 
This is something so beautifully done. We do not understand the beauty of this creation and the Creator because we see only a small part of it. You cannot understand the whole if you see a part of it. Here is the painting picture of my master. I put one glance and I can see hardly a very small part of a second and I can appreciate the whole picture. I have also another means of examining go step by step one, one inch at a time. I can cut this whole picture into thousand pieces small, small pieces, and I can put them all on the table here. That's my master's picture in pieces on my table. And I can keep on seeing one after the other. I can see all my life, I won't see the picture. Why? You cannot see the whole if you continue to see the parts. Our life here is seeing only parts, very small parts. The two things dividing us. The main way of division of the whole into parts is the creation of time and space. Time and space divides into here and there, now and then. This here and there and now and then is dividing our entire experience of reality into small pieces. We can't see reality sitting here because of this division. We divide our own self into the many, all looking different all looking different, all different people. Some friends, some foes, some we like, some we don't. All division. Division amongst souls, so many souls. Not only one soul, now so many souls. Division. We can't appreciate what collectively all of us would be. We can't even, it's beyond imagination, beyond mental effort. It's something that you can realize by pulling yourself back to the state. Because the whole experience of division is taking place from where the reality of yourself, oneself is. It's not coming from anywhere else. That oneself is generating the whole experience of the many and the whole experience of parts being created out of the whole. But we are seeing, experiencing only parts, therefore we cannot see the whole. No matter how long we are here, it can be a million of years, we cannot see the whole. Because just like seeing this picture, little, little pieces over and over again, never see the whole. Our reality is one whole. The totality of consciousness is a real self that manifests even today. How many selves are here, there today, in this building? Only one. All others are being seen by the self. But can you locate them where they are? No, each one is experiencing the self. But each one of you, including myself, and all the billions of people outside of the world, each one is only one experiencing everything, not two. Even now, even in this world, the experiencer is only one. The rest are all experience of the one. But we don't know where the one is. Is the one distributed? No, it's still whole. How do we find out it's still whole? When you wake up to the ultimate reality and find at different levels of dreaming, all so many were created. And then you discover all were being created from one source. All were part of the one. Not only all people, all things, all matter, all non-matter, all energy, everything is being generated from the one. Imagine what an opportunity to be able to find that one. In this life, while you are sitting separated as human beings, the ability to find that one inside yourself, nowhere outside, have to travel nowhere to find that, but within your own self. No distance to travel. It's all within the head, small part of our body. What greater miracle can there be? I can't even imagine a greater miracle than this possibility open to us. But how many of you, how many of us are doing it? Very few. Why? 
if it's such an open truth, why are we not all taking advantage of this wonderful truth? Why are all the billions of people created human beings taking advantage of this truth? Because the whole experiment was to create such reality that you should take it as absolutely real, which we are doing. That was the purpose of creation, to create reality, not illusion, not shadows. Shadows were used to create reality, and reality has been created. These are different levels of realities that have been created, not different levels of illusion. If the word illusion can be used, we might say the illusion is we think that there is a solid universe outside. It's like a hologram. It's created by shadow. It's created by like a projector on a screen. But it's made into three dimensions. Since science discovered that it is not necessary to use any glasses on the eyes to create a 3D effect, which was thought at one time, just 10 years ago, that you have to use red and green glasses to put two screens which were red and green and you made them combined. Then they put Polaroid glasses. At Polaroid glasses can see one in one vertical axis, one on and the horizontal axis, and there were two pictures, you see two eyes, and they combined them. Now they have designed on a single screen. You can build this into the screen itself and generate the 3D experience. That has led people, scientists, to believe today that we could be a two-dimensional space and two-dimensional time. And this three-dimensional effect has been created by the same methods we can now create it artificially. Imagine where technology is also teaching us things which help us to understand the true nature of this creation. So it's beautifully done. And I'm so happy that all of you who assembled here, all of you who joined me here, are serious seekers, seekers of the truth. I know you are not here for anything else. We are co-travelers. You are traveling on the same path I am traveling. That is why you are here. And I am very happy. Having had a little lead, maybe in years, maybe in getting an opportunity to spend a little more time with a great master, a little lead in having some experiences that I am sharing with you. I am not teaching anything. I am telling you that if you follow these teachings, which I followed, the results will be so delightful, so wonderful, you never regret them. That you will feel this was the way, this is the way. And if you want to go about like I did and examine all the different paths, spiritual or otherwise, available to you, go ahead. I think sometimes we have to do that for the sake of our mind. Our mind wants conviction, wants to be convinced. So we want to check out everything. Good, he ordered me. Today I find he not only allowed me, he ordered me, go and check out what else is there. And I was able to spend a lot of time checking out what is available. I met more gurus than anybody I know. I met more yogis and swamis than anybody I know. I experimented more with all these things than anybody I know. And then came back to the realization, he is talking of the ultimate truth. And he is giving you a simple way, a very simple way. But we have made it difficult. If we want to make it easy, follow the tips that he gives us. Many of the things I am sharing with you today, I got those clarifications by actually meeting and discussing with him. And not that all of them just came like that. I had doubts and I got them clarified from him. I had questions, I asked him. And I encourage you, those who are initiated by masters, please do not hesitate to ask questions. Do not hesitate to get clarification. Do not hesitate if you are stuck at a particular point and don't make any progress to check why you are stuck and what you can do to overcome it and move forward. Please use all the advantages you have today. Advantages of digital communications, advantages of emails and so on, 
and use them fully to understand that you can overcome every obstacle. The pathway is all inside, nothing outside. And take full advantage. I know there is a long list of names given to me of people who want to see me personally. Very little time is being allotted to them. Two minutes. I want to spend two hours with each of them. <laughs> discuss the whole thing that they want to discuss. But this, this is a logi logistical difficulty <coughs> that time is limited. <coughs> and I am giving preference to those who never met me and get a chance to see me now. And I do not know if I'll be able to see even all of them on that list today. This is the, our last day. But I will give them as much time as I can. And those, especially those who are newcomers, have not seen me before. I will request Jonathan, the president of Isha, that organizes these things, that Jonathan will please forward those names who are not able to get time here to my next event so that when they come, they'll be placed at the top of the list and they'll definitely get time. That's the best thing I can do to accommodate everybody. I hope you will bear with me about this because the list is long, time is short. We'll try to accommodate as many as possible. So since only two minutes are being given to each, just bring up the most important thing that is bothering you or that you want to ask a question on and that. And I know uh, some people come and they have no question. They say, we have no question. I said, good, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> no, we have two minutes. <laughs> we have two minutes. <laughs> okay, I understand. I understand. It's out of luck, out of feeling of luck that they're saying that. And I appreciate it very much. And I hope that we'll be able to, I'll be able to, while I'm still alive, at my old age, I don't know when the great master will call me, but I'll try to help as many of the seekers as I can. This is all under his direction, under his power, and anything I say, remember the parrot story, I have a parrot, but not the one that got the beans. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for very patient listening, and I'll start meeting some people now, and uh, I'll come back to say, final farewell to you at 3 o'clock. I see you at 3 o'clock. Thank you.